<laughs> not used to it. <laughs> so the first class was a little bit of uh, revisiting or seeing again what you've seen in, in other courses. And today we'll finish um, revising just off the balance and thermal wind, and then we'll start introducing the Ekman layers in the ocean. Okay? So I think we stopped we stopped here uh, last time. So basically what we what we said is that the hydrostatic balance is nothing but a it's nothing but a this is annoying. See meeting going on, I know. Uh, it's nothing but a small scale aspect ratio approximation. Okay? We just need the uh, vertical scales to be much smaller than the horizontal scales and then you can approximate the vertical velocities well you can neglect them okay you're not saying they're zero you're just saying that they're very small and so you can neglect them okay so today we'll look again at the dystrophic balance and uh, show sure remember what you what you remember very well so if the Rossby number is sufficiently small and we, we saw the Rossby number again in the first lecture, then the rotation term dominates over the nonlinear advective terms. Right? And if the time period of the motion scales advectively, so like the advective terms, or if there are no accelerations, so the Lagrangian derivative d by dt is zero, then the rotation term also dominates over the local time derivatives, of course. Okay? And so the only terms that can balance the rotation is, as you know, equal 1 over rho dp by dx and v mu 1 over rho dp by dy. And this is the geostrophic balance. Okay, so the pressure gradient is balanced by the Coriolis term in the horizontal momentum equation. So now you can define geostrophic velocities. So you can say that f ug, so ug is the geostrophic velocity, is just by y, okay, and f vg is one of the row dp by dx. Okay, so this will be the geostrophic velocities. And we'll remember this because then we will start introducing the Ekman layer where you don't have a geostrophic balance. And so we will have, we, we will decompose the velocities into a geostrophic part and a no geostrophic part, which is the Ekman velocity. And so geostrophic flow is parallel to lines of constant pressures, okay? So we know that this goes uh, across pressure gradients. So it's going to be, the geostrophic velocity is going to be parallel to lines of constant pressure or isobars, or in the ocean, for example, isopycnons, okay? So lines of constant density. And so, you know, if F is defined to be positive, as in the northern hemisphere, then the flow will go down the pressure gradient, and then Coriolis will kick in, and it will swing the current to the right in the northern hemisphere. And in the southern hemisphere, where F is defined to be negative, then the uh, geostrophic velocity will go down the pressure gradient, and then will be deflected to the left of the pressure gradient. Okay? And so you have a nice, you have a nice schematic here, okay, of a geostrophically balanced flow with a positive value of Coriolis parameter, so F is larger than zero is positive, okay? So flow is parallel to lines of constant pressures, there you have a high pressure and a low pressure, and so in the northern, in the northern hemisphere they will go clockwise around the high pressure and anti-clockwise around the low pressure, okay? So now you can consider a horizontal flow Okay, in Buzinesque approximation. So Buzinesque horizontal flow. Okay, so in this case the continuity equation is just it reduces to this. Okay, this is the continuity equation for a horizontal flow in the Buzinesque approximation. So now what we can do is define a function, which we call psi of x, y, and t. Okay. 
such that mu is defined as sort of y and v is the psi dx. Okay? So if you define your function uh, like this, then the continuity equation is satisfied. And what does that mean? That means that you have just defined a string function. of your flow, okay, which is a function of the horizontal flow, x and y, and it's a function of time. And you have just defined your string function to be like this in order to satisfy the continuity equation. Okay. So now if we go if we go back to the geostrophic balance, so this, and we uh, say that the Coriolis force is a constant, so f is a constant. Okay. which is a bit of an approximation, but sometimes you make this approximation. We will see that when we will start developing the uh, theories for the wind-driven jars, we will start with f equals zero, then f equal constant, and then f a function of latitude. So we will build this step by step. So if we define the Coriolis force to be constant, and density doesn't vary in the horizontal, then the geostrophic flow, the geostrophic flow is no divergent. And this is necessary in order to say that UG, so the geostrophic flow, which is UG EX plus DBG DY is equal to zero, okay? So it's no divergent in the case of a constant F. So now you can define again a string function, but now it's going to be a geostrophic string function. Okay? And you're going to write this as P over F rho. Okay? And if we plug that in, you have that the geostrophic velocity will be again defined with your new string function, which is a geostrophic string function. Okay? So this is a general string function for a business horizontal flow. Now you go back to your geostrophically balanced flow, which is given by this. Okay? So if you define your geostrophic string function to be P over P over F rho, then you can write, you know, you go, you put the F here. So your UG is going to be d by dy of psi, where psi is defined to be p over f rho because f is a constant, so it, go, it can go into the uh, derivative. Okay. So now you have defined a string function for the geostrophic flow. And why does this matter? Because this is exactly what we looked at the last time. If you remember this plot okay, from a model, what I, what I did here is take the velocities from the model, u and v, okay, and then compute a string function. And you compute the string function just like this, okay, in a timing sense. So you time average your velocities, and then you compute a string function, and then you integrate your string function zonally. So this is a global zonal integration of the string function, and then you integrate your string function vertically to get rid of the uh, vertical velocity. Okay, and so all those line, all those black lines are lines of a constant string function. Okay, and between two string functions, then you have a transport of mass given by your flow. Okay, and that transport of mass or volume in this case is is given in Sverdrup's. So the units of your string function, so your string function will be in in Sverdrup, where one Sverdrup is ten to the six meter cube per seconds. Okay, so there we're just plotting a string function, which is just computed like this, zonally and vertically integrated. Okay, so that's why we well, we use string functions every day.
Okay. So now we can we can make an example of a of a more general case that would be used uh, when we start introducing the wind driven gyres. Okay, so here we said that f is a constant, which obviously is, is not a realistic case. So now consider that f is a function of latitude. So f is a function of y, okay, the latitude, which is the real case. Okay. So how can you have a no divergent flow? You can have a no divergent flow if you have graph dot of f u equals zero, where now f is a function of latitude, okay? So that's the case for a uh, dystrophic flow when f is a function of latitude. Now, if you cross differentiate equation 219, which was the equations for the dystrophic flow, f u g minus 1 over rho dp dy, and f v g 1 over rho dp dx. Okay, you have your geostrophic flow. Now you want to cross differentiate this. So you do this by dx, so it's f d by dx of g equal 1 minus rho. This, and then here you're differentiating with respect to y, but f is a function of y. So you have df dy g plus f d by y of g x d y okay so you do uh, one plus the other and you're left with the f by d y g plus f d u g d x plus d u g d y equal to zero. Okay? Or you can write this as f by dy y your geostrophic flow, meridional, plus f in a more condensed form. Okay? So your geostrophic flow can be reduced to this, and in this case is, is not divergent. So this can also be written as beta, where beta is the meridional gradient of F. Okay, you've seen beta. Beta dg equal to minus e by e z of w. Okay? And so what this is, which is written there, this is just the geostrophic vorticity balance. Right? And it's also called this Virgil balance. And when we uh, when we start developing the uh, theories for the wind-driven gyres, we will start with this Virgil balance. Okay, so what is this vector balance saying? It's saying that the vertical velocity resulting from external agent, in this case, is going to be the wind stress acting over the surface. Uh, so the vertical shear and the vertical velocity balances a meridional current. Okay? So you have a vertical shear in the vertical velocity, and we will see how you can generate the vertical velocities through the Ekman layer. So you have some wind stress, and that wind stress will generate a vertical velocity. And the vertical shear in that vertical velocity is balanced by a meridional current, Vg. Okay. V is the meridional component of the geostrophic velocity. And then the sign of the uh, meridional velocity is given by beta. Okay. Or F, which is the planetary vorticity gradient. So how can you have a vertical velocity 
that's happening when you have a nausea or curl in the wind stress. That's why I said the last time that it's not the wind stress that is driving the interior circulation, it's the curl of the wind stress. Okay? That's what you need, and we will see this when we, when we start deriving the Ekman layers. You need a curl in the wind stress to generate an Ekman layer, and that Ekman layer will have a vertical velocity at the edge of the Ekman layer associated with the, uh, with the wind stress input of momentum. And that vertical velocity will have a vertical shear. And that vertical velocity will be balanced by a meridional geostrophic flow in the interior. Okay? So you get a picture. You have, you have a wind stress with a curl. Okay? So this is my wind stress with a curl. And that wind stress with a curl will generate an ECMA layer. And at the edge of that ECMA layer, there will be a vertical velocity associated with the ECMA layer, transmitting momentum. Okay? And because you have a vertical shear in this vertical velocity, you have some d by dz of w. And this will be balanced by an interior geostrophic flow. So now we go into the geostrophic regime. Okay? So now there will be a geostrophic flow in this or that direction, which is balancing the input of momentum at the top. So this is how you get from a wind stress to driving an interior circulation geostrophically balanced is through an ECMA layer. The ECMA layer provides the vertical velocity, which then is balanced by a vertical, by a meridional uh, interior geostrophic flow. Okay? So that's how a wind stress of the surface can drive an interior geostrophic flow, which is meridional. Okay? So there will be, if, if this is the North Atlantic, for example, okay? you will have an interior geostrophic flow which goes either towards the equator or towards the pole because you have a V, okay? And that's the result of the curl of the wind stress. Okay? So that's how, basically that's how you go from uh, uh, the geostrophic flow, then you apply another divergent flow and you say fine, but if F is not constant, which is not, okay? F is not constant, you can get a vorticity balance. And the vorticity balance is nothing but an input of momentum from the surface, from wind stress, balanced by a meridional geostrophic flow. Okay. And what is in between is what we will look uh, next in the ECMA layer. Okay. Another nice concept is thermal wind balance, which I'm sure you've seen in, the, uh, in atmospheric dynamics. Okay. So because oceanography chronologically came after meteorology or atmospheric science, we, we borrowed many of the theories from atmospheric physics, and we also borrowed the name, okay? and we didn't, we didn't bother changing them. Okay? So we actually use thermal wind, thermal wind balance in the ocean as well, okay? which obviously is a concept that comes from from the atmospheric flow, okay? So how do you get to the thermal wind balance? So you take hydrostatic balance and you take geostrophic balance and you combine the two and then you can use thermal wind balance. And we'll see that thermal wind balance is actually very useful in the ocean when you actually measure velocities, okay? And you want to compute, and you want to compute what is the geostrophic flow in the vertical, okay? Or, or the shear, which is even more important. Okay, so you first take the vertical derivative of the geostrophic equations. Okay, so you have this, du by dz. du by y. Okay, just taking the vertical derivative of the, um, of the geostrophic equations. And then you combine this with the hydrostatic balance. Okay. And you get to rho naught f dz of u is equal to g is a constant. Uh, dy of p, okay, just changing the order of the uh, differentiation. 
and we're not f dz of v is minus g dx of v. Okay, and this is the thermal wind balance that you've seen in atmospheric physics. So what is it saying? It's saying that the uh, geostrophic velocity, and these are geostrophic velocities, okay? Geostrophic velocities, they have a vertical shear, okay? And that vertical shear, which is called the thermal wind shear, is associated with the, well, I've changed. Is associated with the horizontal gradient in density, okay? So if you have a horizontal gradient density, then you have a vertical shear in your in your geostrophic velocities. Okay? How can you have a horizontal shear in density? Well, we get more insulation at the equator, we get less insulation towards the pole, so you have a horizontal gradient in temperature. If you have a horizontal gradient in temperature and you neglect salinity effect, then you have a horizontal gradient in density. And so just by having a horizontal gradient in density or temperature, you develop a vertical shear in your geostrophic velocities. Okay? So, in this case, where you have this equator, and this is the North Pole, for example, okay? so you have more insulation at the equator, less insulation at the, uh, towards the pole, so it gets denser and denser as you move towards the pole, right, in the ocean. So row 3 is larger than row 2 and is larger than row 1, okay? Temperature decreases towards the pole, so it gets denser. So what do you have? Do you have a um, zero dy, which is positive, okay? It's getting denser towards the pole. If you have a zero by dy, which is positive, then, uh, so you take that equation, go around F, G, zero by dy, okay? Imagine we have zonal integrated the, uh, the flow, so, the row by the x is equal to zero, so this equation goes. So you're left with this thermal wind balance in a 2D, in a 2D picture. Okay? So if d rho by dy is positive, then ug is positive. So in this case, we will have a flow with u, the zonal component of velocity, is positive, so defined to be out of the board. Okay, so UG is positive. And if this is positive, DZ UG is also positive. Okay, so that means that the vertical shear of the, uh, of the uh, geostrophic current is intensified towards the surface. Okay, you have a vertical shear, so you start from a, you have, you start from a geostrophic velocity at the surface, and then you'll have a uh, surface intensified flow with a vertical shear in the vertical. So what you get, you get a larger geostrophic flow at the surface which decreases towards the depth, okay? Because of that vertical shear. So why is that useful? Because if you know the uh, horizontal gradient in temperature or, or density, okay, if you measure that, then you know what the vertical shear of the geostrophic velocity is. Okay? If you know the vertical shear of the geostrophic velocity, you can integrate this as long as you know the value at some point over the uh, integral path. Okay? And then you can recover the geostrophic velocity over the entire column. So usually you take, maybe you've seen this in physics of the ocean, uh, usually you take a level of no motion at some point, 3,000 meters, 4,000 meters, well, depending on where you are, you choose a level of no motion, and then you start integrating upwards your vertical uh, 
shear in geostrophic velocity, and you recover the value of the geostrophic velocity. Okay. So thermal imbalance is, is pretty is pretty useful. If you remember the, uh, the when we were talking about surface currents in the ocean, you have wind driven gyres, and then you have a very strong current that is called the Antarctic circumpolar current. Right? The Antarctic circumpolar current is has a picture that is similar to this. Okay. But now we are in the southern hemisphere, so you have the south pole on one side going towards the uh, going towards the uh, equator, okay? And you actually have isopic nulls that are sloping like this, okay? So this would be um, row three, row two, and row one, getting denser and denser towards the pole. Uh, you have a wind stress blowing here out of the board, okay. and you generate a current which is called the ACC, okay, which is surface intensified and is in thermal wind bounds. Okay. If you know if you know the meridional gradient in temperature and density, then through thermal wind bounds you can compute the uh, velocity of the ACC, which is in fact westward. Okay. So it travels out of the board in this case. Okay. So through thermal wind balance, you can also compute, for example, the strength and the vertical structure of the Antarctic circumpolar current. Okay. So that's why you know borrow from the atmosphere and very much used in the ocean as well. Okay, so you probably know all of this already, but I'm trying to put things in perspective for a national graphic point of view. Okay, so we uh, we talk about the geostrophic balance, the thermal wind, uh, the stream function, and we've seen that you can have a vorticity balance between some stress on the surface, which is balanced by a meridional flow. Okay, you need a, not the stress but the curve, and that is balanced by a meridional flow in the interior. How can you get the meridional flow in the interior? Is through is through an Ekman layer that provides you the vertical velocity at the edge of the Ekman layer. Okay. So now we have to introduce friction because we want to connect the wind stress to the interior and we have to do that through a boundary layer where friction is important, where the effect of the wind stress is felt and so friction must be important. So we are going to move away from the geostrophic balance. Okay? So that region is called the boundary layer. And so we're going to make a few assumptions here. So first the boundary layer is Buzinesque. Okay? Then the boundary layer obviously has a finite depth, which we can call delta. Okay? And that delta has to be much smaller than, than the total depth of the ocean, otherwise we will not be able to develop an interior flow. Within the boundary layer, obviously frictional terms are important because in that boundary layer is where we feel the wind stress. And the geostrophic balance holds everywhere else. In this case, we are thinking of a top boundary layer at the surface, and so below of that boundary layer there will be a geostrophic flow where friction is not important and we can use the geostrophic equations again. We're going to say that nonlinear time dependent terms are negligible and that the geostrophic balance holds in the vertical again. Okay. And this is what we call an Ekman layer. Do we know do you know what we call it an Ekman layer? You know, you know the story of Nansen and Ekman? Okay. So this is the uh, this is an example for a bottom boundary layer. Okay? So wherever you are within the delta boundary layer, there friction is important. And outside of delta, then the flow is in just traffic bounds. Okay? So now we have to introduce friction. So we go back to our momentum equation.
Okay, these are the standard momentum equations that we use so far, and we introduce friction. We introduce the force in the x component and the y component. Okay, so now there would be friction. So let's assume there's no acceleration; we're in a steady state, and so we get rid of this time derivatives. Okay, and we're left with that system. So now, if you remember. Newton's law of friction right? the uh, Newton's law of viscosity was something like this relating the uh, stress at the surface to a vertical gradient in the uh, velocities okay. you can write this as rho this is always difficult Dz, okay, where nu is now the kinematic viscosity. And actually, not for microscopic scales, but for mesoscale dynamics in the ocean, you can write this as u dz. Where now this is called an eddy viscosity. which is important in the vertical. And we know that the value of this vertical viscosity is roughly 10 to the minus 1. Yeah, 10 to the minus 1. Okay? Much larger than the microscopic scale. Okay? Roughly 10 to the minus 1. Just an order of magnitude. Now you can write the uh, frictional stresses per unit masses. So you write the frictional stresses per unit mass and you take the uh, vertical derivative of that stress into the uh, Ekman layer. And so this is 1 over or not because it's per unit mass. And you take the vertical derivative of that AZ du dz. Oh, let's forget this. Okay, just a more component. And so this is just AZ. Okay, so this is going to be my frictional stresses per unit mass with some eddy viscosity value of roughly 10 to the minus 1. Sir? Yeah? It's between the kinematic viscosity and the eddy viscosity. Sorry? The kinematic viscosity and the eddy viscosity. Yeah, so this so. This is the, the uh, viscosity, this is the kinematic viscosity. Then, for our purposes of geophysical flows, we use a viscosity which is not a microscopic viscosity. Okay. It's a larger viscosity acting on, on large scale fluids. Okay. And we call that eddy viscosity. They come about from eddy stresses. Okay, so, in this case, uh, you have mu prime, omega prime. This is going to give you an eddy viscosity. Those are eddy stresses. Have you seen the eddy stresses already? Probably seen eddy stresses, right? So those eddy stresses will give you a viscosity on a micro scale, and those are the uh, those are the viscosities felt by a large scale flow, not the microscopic viscosity. Okay? And that and that eddy viscosity has a value of roughly ten to the minus one. Okay, so you okay. can just assume. Uh, uh, we give a parameter. Yeah, we give a parameter which you know usually is not constant, obviously, but we just give a parameter to this, okay. which is roughly 10 to the minus 1. So now we can go back to the momentum equation and we replace this frictional stresses by what we know. Okay, so these are going to be my equation of motions where friction is important. Or you can write this in a much nicer way as minus one of the row. Okay. 
Okay, so these are the equation of motion for a fluid where friction is important. Just add in the uh, frictional stresses. Then you add the hydrostatic balance that we said we have hydrostatic balance and continuity. Yes, that's, that's the larger uh, component of the friction effects. So the, the horizontal component is much smaller at these scales, it's much smaller than the vertical component, especially because you have a, a, a surface stress at the surface, okay, which is providing momentum in the vertical. So the particle will feel viscosity in the vertical direction much more than in the horizontal direction. Okay. So that's, that's, the, that's the only component that we consider. Okay, so you know the Ackman number, which was something like this. Okay, you can do the scale analysis there and recover the Ackman number, but I'm sure I'm sure you remember this. And so with this number is smaller than one, then frictional stresses are not important. F dominates, okay? And when, uh, and when the Ekman number is close to 1, then frictional stresses are important, are comparable to the Corellis parameter. So you have to take frictional stresses into account. Okay. So if we don't neglect frictional stresses because we say that the Ekman number is, is close to 1, then frictional stresses are important. And if frictional stresses are important, that means that Frictional stresses are comparable to the Corellis parameter. Right? They're roughly one, so they're roughly the same order of magnitude. And if you do a scale analysis here, you get A Z U over H square goes like F U. Okay? So this means that H square goes like AZ U over F U. And if you put some numbers there, say AZ is 10 to the minus 1, we said, and F is roughly 10 to the minus 4. Okay, just to go, so you have 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 4, this is 10 to the third. Okay. Uh, and it's h squared, so it's meter squared. So this means that h, which is actually delta, okay, yeah, so this, this should be delta, where you feel frictional stresses because these two are roughly the same, the same magnitude. So delta squared is order of magnitude, 10 to the cube. This means that delta is something like 30 meters. So, for a um, eddy viscosity of roughly 10 to the minus 1 and a Corollis parameter of 10 to the minus 4, which are reasonable values, this means that frictional stresses are felt for about 30 meters. So that's roughly, let's say, an order of magnitude for the depth of an Ekman layer in the ocean, about 30 meters. Okay, so now let's do the momentum balance within the Ekman layer. Okay, so let's consider now the full H column where we have some regions where um, Frictional stresses are felt, and some reason where frictional stresses are not felt outside of the boundary layer. So we can write the velocity field as u, some geostrophic flow where you don't feel you don't feel the uh, frictional stresses, plus a non-geostrophic flow which is within the Ekman layer. 
And then you can write the pressure as some isotropic pressure plus a pressure, a, cor a correction within the boundary. Okay. So in the interior, what do we have? In interior, we have the hydrostatic balance. So this is equal to zero because we actually said that buoyancy is a constant. Okay, one of the assumptions that we made at the beginning. So buoyancy minus minus g rho prime over or not. Uh, is constant. Okay, I'm going to do the next flow. So in the interior, we have the other side of balance. And it's giving me this because buoyancy is a constant. Within the boundary layer, d by z of pg is still going to be zero, because it's zero everywhere. So you're just left with pe. And because you need to satisfy the hydrostatic balance again, this also has to be zero. Okay. You have the hydrostatic balance, the p the full is equal to zero because we're taking the case of constant buoyancy. So if the adjustment component is equal to zero in the interior and in the boundary layer, of course, then in the boundary layer you're left with just the Ekman component, which in order to satisfy the balance has to be zero again. So this means that within the boundary layer you don't have a vertical shear in pressure. So there's no boundary layer for pressure. There's only a boundary layer for the velocity but not for pressure. because PE is equal to zero in the interior, right? It doesn't exist in the interior. There's no, there's no correction in the interior. There's just a dystrophic flow. So PE is equal to zero outside of the boundary layer. And if there's no boundary layer for pressure, then PE has to be zero everywhere. Okay, in the interior, PE is equal to zero. And in the boundary layer, P has to be equal to zero because there's no boundary layer for pressure. So if it's zero outside of the boundary layer, it has to be zero within the boundary layer because there's no boundary layer for pressure. Okay. So there's no boundary layer for pressure. And that's very important. So this means that for the Ekman layer, and this is probably the expression that you remember, for the Ekman layer, then the horizontal momentum equations are just this, okay? Because there's no there's no PE, okay? There's no boundary layer in pressure, so this term vanishes. So for the Ekman layer, this is the uh, momentum equations that we have. So we have a balance between Coriolis and Frictional stresses at the surface. Okay, there's, there's no. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, considering buoyancy to be constant, it means that there is no acceleration in the vertical, or it means it has a constant acceleration in the vertical. Buoyancy is a constant, so it has a single value. So that means it's just a constant, like, let's say vertical. Acceleration. It's constant in the vertical. And, okay. and we are assuming. That means that the pressure is zero. So we're, we're saying that because buoyancy is a constant, then this is my hydrostatic balance in the interior. I mean, there's no difference okay. in the pressure in the interior. There's no, there's no vertical shear pressure. Okay? It's an assumption. Okay? Okay, so there's, there's no vertical shearing pressure in the geostrophic, in the geostrophic. So outside of the boundary layer, there's no PE. There's no Ekman component, boundary layer component of pressure. So outside of the boundary layer, this is the hydrostatic balance. You only have PG. And this is the hydrostatic balance. 
PG is equal to zero also in the boundary layer. Okay. So in the boundary layer, you, you don't have the contribution of just trophic P. You only have the contribution of the uh, Ekman P. Okay. And, and this is what is left in the boundary layer in order to satisfy the uh, hydrostatic balance. Okay. But because P is equal to zero in the interior, okay, and there's no vertical shear, that has to be zero everywhere. Okay, so PE is zero also in the boundary layer. And so there is no boundary layer for pressure. Okay. And so if there's no there's no PE in the uh, in the momentum equations, and so you're left with this expression for the momentum equation within the boundary layer. Okay, so the Force balance in the Ekman layer is between Coriolis and friction, which is which is probably you probably knew already. Okay. Okay. So I have five minutes, so I'll just read this. So now we want to know. Okay, what is happening within the boundary layer? What is most important in the boundary layer is not so much the details of the spiral of the boundary layer that you have probably studied the solution and blah, blah. But what, it, what is really interesting for the large scale ocean circulation is the integrated properties of the uh, boundary layer of the Ekman layer. Okay? So you want to know what is happening within the boundary layer and you want to know eventually what is going to be the vertical velocity at the base of the Ekman layer. Okay? So the details within the boundary layer for the large scale ocean circulation are not particularly important. Okay. So now you have some momentum equations which are called the frictional geostrophic balance uh, equation, which are this, okay, the one at the surface, the 3.18. Well, we didn't specify an expression for the frictional stress, okay? So we just use tau. And tau obviously is zero at the edge of the Ekman layer at the bottom because you don't feel stress anymore. So tau is equal to zero at the edge of the Ekman layer. So in the Ekman layer, we have that equation, okay, which is what we just derived here, without saying nothing about tau. Okay. So that's the uh, momentum equation within the Ekman layer. So what are the uh, integral properties within the Ekman layer? Okay. So then you integrate over the thickness delta of the Ekman layer. So you just take that equation and you integrate in the vertical within the Ekman layer. Okay. And if you integrate in the vertical this tau, then you will get some tau at the top minus some tau at the bottom. Okay. Now you can define, remember this integral, okay. you can define the mass transport within the Ekman layer, okay. just called capital ME which is just that integral, so the integral of the Ekman layer velocities integrated over the full depth of the Ekman layer. So that is going to be the agiostrophic, you're not in geostrophic balance, you're in a frictional Coriolis balance. So this is going to be the mass transport within the Ekman layer. And then you know that for a bottom Ekman layer, so you are I have two Ekman layers, one at the top and one at the bottom. For the bottom Ekman layer, stress at the top will be zero because you have friction with the bottom. Okay, so tau top is equal to zero. And for a top Ekman layer, you will have tau bottom equal zero because you have the effect of the wind stress at the surface. Right. So you can reduce the previous equation, this, to these two cases. Okay? For a top Ekman layer, you have F cross the agiostrophic mass transport will be given by the stress at the top. And for a bottom Ekman layer, is the agiostrophic mass transport is minus tau at the bottom over F. Okay? So that will give you the mass transport. 
or you can obviously you can write it like this. Okay, so the mass transport at the top is proportional to this. So here what you see is that the mass transport within the ECMA layer is proportional to the curl of the wind stress. Okay? And that is what you need. You need the curl of the wind stress. So now you can take a situation in which tau x is equal to zero. Okay. So tau x is equal to zero, you only have you only have tau in the y direction. So suppose tau x is equal to zero. And then for a topic my layer, you look at this, and you know that the uh, meridional adiostrophic mass transport is going to be equal to zero because tau x is equal to zero, whereas the zonal adiostrophic mass transport is going to be positive for a positive defined meridional wind stress. So you will have a positive m x and x Okay? which is the uh, solution that you know already that the net transport and it's the net transport because this is the uh, adiostrophic mass transport has been integrated over the full Ekman layer okay? so the net transport for the whole Ekman layer is at right angles to the stress tensor okay? so you have a stress at the surface in this case meridional and the integrated transport within the Ekman layer in this case is 90 degrees to the, uh, to the transport to the uh, stress in the northern hemisphere is to the right, and in the southern hemisphere, obviously, is to the left because it depends on the sine of f. Okay. So what the only thing that you need to know is the curl of the wind stress, and then you know how much adiostrophic transport you are producing within the Ekman layer. So an interesting thing that we will see we will, we will see the difference between a top Ekman layer and a bottom Ekman layer in the ocean. So what is happening? Here and what is happening here, okay, is the same equation but flipped. Okay, here you feel the stress on the surface, and here you feel the friction at the bottom. And is the instead of having a wind stress acting at the edge, you have the geostrophic flow. So you remember that here in the interior, you have a geostrophic flow. Right? So here is the wind stress generating an Ekman layer and producing some vertical velocity. Whereas here you have a geostrophic flow, which through friction at the bottom is generating this bottom Ekman layer. Okay, we will see this. And the nice thing is that the mass transport, and so you can, th you can think about the uh, ocean and the atmosphere now. And you can think about the ocean and the atmosphere are, as being, if this is the ocean, I have a... Uh, Ekman layer here at the top, right? And then I have my atmosphere on top with an Ekman layer as well, but it's a bottom Ekman layer for the atmosphere. Okay. And now they're both driven by the same wind stress, okay? And so they have the same magnitude and they transport the same. Listen, they transport the same mass. So the mass transport in a top oceanic and bottom atmospheric layers, they are equal. They transport the same mass because the mass, remember the equation there, is just given by the curl of the wind stress. Okay. But they are opposite, okay, because this is a top Ekman layer. We will see that the net transport will be to the right in the northern hemisphere, and the net transport in the Ekman layer in the atmosphere, which is the bottom, would be to the left. Okay. So we will see that they are equal in magnitude, they have the same mass transport because they are driven by the same wind stress, but actually opposite. And a nice example of this is, in reality, is what is going on at the equator. So this is a schematic. Uh, you see there at zero degrees, the equator, 30 south and 30 north which are roughly the boundaries of the Hadley cells and also the boundaries of the subtropical cells in the ocean, which are these circulations here. These are meridional overturning cells, which are quite shallow, maximum 500 meters, okay? and they are driven by the wind stress, these red arrows. Okay? So you have those red arrows, that's the uh, zonal wind stress going west in that case, okay? and you have an Ekman flow 
to the right at the surface. Okay? And that's the surface branch of the isotropical cells. Then the isotropical cell, they subduct roughly a third south. And then within the interior, they flow back towards the equator. And then there's an upwelling branch. And you close this subtropical cell. The strength of the subtropical cell is given by the wind stress. And the same thing is the Hadley cell, which is here. Okay? These Hadley cells are driven mainly, they're thermally directly driven. And they're driven by the same, and they, uh, they produce the same wind stress. Okay. And so these two Hadley cell and tropical cells, in a way, they're also coupled because they're coupled through the same wind stress. Okay. And the magnitude and the change in these in this cells, you know, there's, there's some people thinking that the variability between the Hadley cells and the tropical cells, they're linked. And so if you increase the strength in mass transport, energy transport in one of the two, the other one is compensating because they're transporting energy in the opposite directions. Okay, so that's a nice example of how the wind stress and the atmosphere layers, they, uh, they interact. So the last thing, which is the, uh, the most important and also very easy. So what happens at the edge of the ECMA layer? So you have a wind stress at the surface providing momentum. You generate an ECMA layer of A thickness delta, whatever. Then you integrate that ageostrophic velocity, and you get a ageostrophic mass transfer within the ECMA layer. But the important thing is that you generate a vertical velocity at the edge of the ECMA layer. Okay? So if you start from the mass conservation equation, which is that equation over there, okay? so you have a mass conservation within the ECMA layer, you integrate over the ECMA layer delta, okay? and you get this equation. Now you remember the expression, the expre expression for the ageostrophic mass transport, which was just this the integral over the vertical of the ageostrophic velocities within the Ekman layer, that was m. Okay. And if you plug this ageostrophic mass transport in here, you simply get this. Okay. 1 over rho grad dot of the mass transport is equal to the integral over the full Ekman layer of d by dz of the vertical velocity, okay? Easy. And so this, you can rewrite this integral as minus vertical velocity at the top minus the vertical velocity at the bottom. Now you can go back to this equation, which is this, okay, that we've seen before. 320, okay, when you were integrating over the full Ekman layer, your your equation of motions. Okay, is this? You take the curl of this equation, and you will find this expression. Okay, take the curl of this, you get a grad dot of the mass transport is equal to the curl of tau at the top minus tau at the bottom over f. Okay, so you just take the curl of that equation. Now. With the curl of this equation, you go back here. You see you have grad dot me and grad dot me. So you plug this here. So you have 1 over rho of grad dot me is equal to minus velocity at the top minus vertical velocity at the bottom. Okay? Which is equal to 1 over rho of the curl of the wind stress. Okay, so you got to this, you got to this expression. Now you forget about this, and you have an expression that relates the vertical velocity to the curl of the wind stress. So for a top Ekman layer, and you're here, vertical velocity at the top is going to be equal to zero. You just have, you just have a vertical velocity at the bottom, right? So you, you only have this, vertical velocity at the bottom. And this vertical velocity at the bottom is going to be minus minus plus, 
one over all of the curl of tau at the top because you only have tau at the top. Right? So for a surface Ekman layer in the ocean, you have a vertical velocity at the edge, at the bottom edge of the Ekman layer, which is given by the curl of the wind stress over F. Okay, so in order to know what is the uh, vertical velocity at the bottom of the Ekman layer, the only thing that you need to know is the curl of the wind stress. If you know the curl of the wind stress, you know what is the vertical velocity associated with that curl of the wind stress for a top Ekman layer. If you have a bottom Ekman layer, so for example the ocean, the atmosphere, uh, vertical velocity at the bottom is going to be equal to zero because you are at the bottom. So you're left with vertical velocity at the top minus uh, is equal to the curl of minus tau b, so that's a plus and a plus. So you have a vertical velocity at the top, which is again given by the curl of the wind stress at the bottom or friction at the bottom. Okay. Here tau is just a frictional stress. So for a bottom Ekman layer, you have a w top, which is just proportional to the curl of tau beta, okay. tau b, tau bottom, okay. which in this case is not the wind stress, but is a frictional stress with the bottom. Okay, so friction which can be a wind stress or friction with the bottom, induces a vertical velocity at the edge of the aircraft layer okay. that is proportional to the curl of the stress. And the vertical velocity, as you know, is called Ekman pumping or Ekman suction, depending on the side. And the production of this vertical velocity at the edge of the Ekman layer is one of the most important things of the Ekman layer. We don't, you know, if you think about the large scale of circulation, you don't care about the spiral, you don't care about what is the viscosity within the Ekman layer, we don't care. We care about the integrated properties of the Ekman layer. So the integrated mass transport within the Ekman layer, and especially the vertical velocity produced by this Ekman layer. So the only thing that we care is not so much how deep it is, but what is the vertical velocity induced by the curl of the wind stress. And that's because this vertical velocity at the edge of the Ekman layer will transmit the momentum in the ocean, for example, it will transmit the, the, uh, the momentum from the wind stress to the interior. So here you have an interior geostrophic flow that will be affected by this vertical velocity at the edge of the Ekman layer. Okay? If you now go back and remember the, uh, the uh, vorticity balance that I showed you before, there was a wind stress on one side and that was balanced by a meridional geostrophic flow on the other side. Okay? So how do you connect the wind stress and the geostrophic flow is through this vertical velocity at the edge of the Ekman layer. Okay? That, that's, what, that's why we care about the Ekman layer when thinking about the large scale ocean circulation. Okay, so we'll finish the Ekman layer next time. I have to go, sorry.